my name is Tim Anderson. I'm executive director of the BC Retired Teachers Association. And it is my very happy duty indeed to welcome you to this, our uh, writer's workshop. We're really thrilled to have you on board. One of the characteristics that really makes uh, BCRTA unique in the uh, retirement association space is our publication, our lifestyle publication postscript. And uh, the thing that makes it great is all the participation we get from our members. And uh, it's the content uh, there that really uh, illustrates what, uh, what retire living well in retirement is about. And uh, it can be challenging, it can be inspiring, it can be heartbreaking, uh, but most of all, it's a good read. And that's what we're about uh, today, talking about what it takes to uh, be an effective contributor to our magazine or to any other kind of publication, whether it be a, uh, a branch newsletter uh, or, or what have you. So we've got a bunch of writers on board here talking about the writing, you know, how long that could possibly take, but we'll try and <laughs> keep it organized into a, about 90 minutes. So uh, today's uh, workshop sponsored by Postscript. Your hosts, uh, myself, I'm the editor of Postscript Magazine, and Karen Cooper is my right-hand person, assistant editor, and we have two special guests today, two wonderful writers, Duncan Lowe and Linda Grace Phillipson. In uh, today's workshop, we're going to have a little bit of an overview of the Postscript process. We're going to pull aside the curtains so you can see what goes on uh, to put together our magazine. We're going to give you some practical tips on writing effectively in different formats. There's different kinds of styles of articles and, and different tools will uh, help you with each of those, depending on what you're aiming for. We'll use examples from um, the articles that we've had in our magazine. And my hope is that you will find uh, through this uh, workshop, a number of useful principles that you can apply to any kind of writing you're doing whether it's for a branch newsletter or other publications, or even just communicating uh, something effectively to other people in the groups you work with. So let's get started with some participation here. I'm gonna launch a poll. Uh, the very first thing we wanna talk about with writers, uh, especially writers who are getting started, is we have to talk about fear and obstacles and uh, so on. So um, let's share with one another, what are the reasons why you might hesitate to write or have some trouble. And there's four choices. I'm scared, I'm lazy, I don't know where to start, or all of the above. Okay, folks, uh, good news, bad news. The bad news is that about half of you who voted don't know where to start. Good news is we're gonna help you with that. <laughs> um, only 5% of you are scared, which I think is uh, good. Oh no, maybe it's not that way because all of the above shows me 29%. So <laughs> uh, we've got a lot of neurotic people on this call. That's great. I'm excited. <laughs> it was nice to meet other neurotic people. Um, we're going to help you with uh, those things. And to help us, I am going to invite uh, now uh, Karen Cooper to join me. And um, let's see if I can highlight you here. Karen. Welcome, Karen. I'm I'm uh, thrilled to to have you here on uh, <laughs> on this day. And um, let's let's start by talking about um, the most important thing, Karen. I mean, here's a pop quiz for you as an editor. Who's the most important person in our in our process? <laughs> the reader. Yes. Not Tim. It's not me. And. Insofar as it's, it's the writers, it's so that they serve the readers. Yeah, yeah. I think that's a really fundamental uh, a point. Um, there's so many temptations we have when we know our name's going to be put in front of, I, I guess, our circulation 17,000 households. Um, there's a lot of temptations to polish our buttons or think that, wow, lots of people are going to be looking at me. But that's not really, from a reader's point of view, that's not very entertaining. <laughs> Um, and I guess that, uh, then we have to track back to uh, what the purpose of the BCRTA is and, and how the, the postscript um, works with that. Um, do you want to highlight a little bit about that, Karen? Um, 
I think the, the deep purpose of the BCRTA is to serve its members in many ways. So Postscript is only one of the ways that mm -hmm. the BCRTA serves its members in providing access to various services and uh, information. And so insurance, information, financial information. Tim does a variety of seminars every year or organizes seminars. The way Postscript fits into that is to come along, I see it as a, an important adjunct to all of those things. Yeah. So I think um, the thing that feels exciting to me about it is, is precisely that we are primarily written by our members. Um, yeah. But and, and I think just picking up on that point, you know, if, if we look at the mission statement of BCRTA, it's to, to foster well being amongst our members. And, and I th think the articles, um, some of them coach you specifically do these things for your well being. But a lot of it is just showing people in real life living well exploring their curiosities and, and learning edges, talking about their fears and, and new things. And it's sort of a demonstration by uh, example, uh, what's in the content of those articles. But one of the things as an editor, I, I think I enjoy, Karen, is when people are using the elements of one type of writing to really enliven an, an, another type of writing. And and I'm thinking particularly of um, travel articles or personal experience articles like we're going to cover later today. Can you talk a little bit about your thoughts on, on where you find articles are effective in that way? Sure. I mean, the, the thing is, and, and my experience so far is a lot of you or almost all of you are readers as well as those of you who have written for Postscript. Um, the articles that really grab people, and this is common across the industry now, are those that use some of the tools of especially fiction. So um, pacing, voice or style, uh, not flat, just narration of fact. Mm. Um, and I think if you think about the articles you've enjoyed in Postscript, you'll start to pick up on what we're talking about. There's a sense that there's a particular author's voice at work and they're shaping the story. They're including dialogue. So in many ways, if you picked up one of the really good articles from Postscript and picked up a short story, if you didn't know the context, you wouldn't necessarily know which was which. Right, mm -hmm. you, you can sense that the authors put the work in to shape their work before they present it. And then of course, me and Tim, so that it comes across and reads in a really compelling, fluid way. I think those yeah. are things that- Yeah, and, and, and it adds up to that, that, that statement of showing, not telling. Exactly. You know, we can say our travel guide, Marco was amazing, but that doesn't really say anything about Marco. But if you draw a picture of Marco and his long hair and his ready grin and the way he pulled out a picture of his kid, suddenly you start to see you start to see the person in front of you and you feel a, more of an emotional engagement. I want, I want to go ahead. And on that point, I have to say very often if I email someone, it's because they've said something like Marco is amazing. And I'll say, can you give me details about how Marco was amazing? Yeah. Or yeah what he was, you know, what was his personality like? How did he speak? What was, you know, so, um, and our less experienced writers, and we want to encourage less experienced writers. I've gotten the response back, well, I didn't want to bore people. What's boring to people is that kind of generalized statement. What's exciting is detail and specifics. Yeah, yeah, very well said. Um, let's just jump ahead. I'm, I'm going to jump around in my notes. If you're an editor, you can handle that. Um, we were talking about different kinds of editing. When people think about editors, they think of it just sort of as a school mind checking their spelling. Um, and we're pretty good at checking spelling too. Um, and we need to be sometimes. Uh, but there's another kind of editing that I think really yields a lot of fruit and that's developmental editing. Maybe you can talk a little bit about the psychology behind developmental editing. Sure, uh, it links directly to the thing we were just talking about. So developmental or 
in the past, it, you, some of you may know the term substantive editing because that was used at certain points for pretty much the same process. This is looking at the broader elements of the text beyond spelling, grammar, punctuation. It's looking at, is the, the voice or style consistent for the whole piece? Um, does the piece flow in a way that pulls the reader along with it both emotionally, so the pacing, but also the order of things. And I don't mean just chronological order. I mean, there's a kind of internal logic to most articles that you want to emphasize. And sometimes that means moving whole paragraphs. Sometimes it means taking something from near the bottom and putting it right at the top. So it's the process of developing the shape and the flow and the style of the article so they all work together to best express what the writer is trying to express. And I have to say as an editor, I'm not trying to rewrite your piece so it sounds like me. I'm trying to help your best article emerge with your right. best voice. Yeah, and I think that's that's uh, well said and important. And I think as we go on uh, in today's workshop, as we look at um, articles by Linda and Duncan, we'll see that, that really uh, in effect. And um, I think if I recall in, in those cases, um, they arrived as really strong articles. And then the editing process said, let's move this here, let's move that there and see what happens. And, and the results were, were uh, really terrific. Um, let's talk a little bit about uh, uh, something that seems kind of fuzzy and is maybe hard for people to get their head around. Um, but I think it's really worth uh, talking about and that's tone. What do we mean when we're talking about tone? Okay, there's several ways to describe tone or voice. One has to do with something called, I'm not gonna to go too deep into this, but I think you'll recognize it intuitively when I use voice. One has to do with um, the register of the voice. So formal to informal. Is this a more formal voice? Is this a more informal voice? You've all been teachers. You have a teacher voice. I know, I've had <laughs> teachers. So, you know, there's a teacher voice, there's a friend voice. There's, so if you think about it in terms of voice, well, that voice comes through on the page and it comes through in dozens of small ways, but it actually is relatively easy to hear when someone breaks voice on the page. I might even have trouble explaining to you why I think you broke voice on the page, but if I sit and look at it, I can use your good, oh, this was a really casual article and they just, just used a 15-bit word. Right. You know? Or, um, here, and we already mentioned this, here, the writer's been treating the reader as a really intelligent person, and here, they don't. And so that's that sense of tone, and it varies depending on the type of article and the writer. So there's, there's a whole range of tones, and we aren't dictating tone, except that we do tend to link, well, you've got all the words, Tim, but we're aiming for positive, informative, engaged, um, friendly toward the reader. Uh, I think that's kind of the overall overarching tone that we're, we're aiming at in the magazine. Yeah, yeah we're, we're, I think one of the benefits that we have of, of, of being a publication that involves members writing for other members is that you're writing for your peers. You're writing for people that you respect uh, and, and have, have some common uh, experiences with you. So, um, you know, and, and BCRTA's, you know, fundamental mission helps us here too, because we're a nonpartisan organization, which means that um, if you've got a really strident, hostile, negative tone that's directed at tearing something down, it's probably not gonna work in our context. Um, we're about lifelong learning. We're about um, exploring new horizons, uh, new boundaries. Um, but not, not um, maybe not from the greenest people on the block. You know, you know our readers have some life experience too. So um, we're going to address them as intelligent readers who, who can um, identify with a lot of things that uh, are talked about. Um, one, of the, um, one of the things that I find the most difficult to deal with it in terms of tone when an article comes in is if it's written in 
the Christmas letter style. And that's, that's a kind of shorthand that I use to you, Karen. And it's, it's the kind of um, letter you get from your cousin who's always bragging about their kids and thinks they're very clever. And there's lots of inside jokes. Well, that's okay maybe to get from your cousin once a year, but it's kind of hard to, to put up with um, that tone for an entire article. So um, if you're ending sentences with um, five exclamation marks, you're, you're probably in trouble. Um, let's have- uh, well, even, even an exclamation mark at the end of every other sentence. We, we get a significant number of articles with an, a lot, I was about to say yeah. an awful lot, I'll say it, an awful lot of exclamation points. Yeah, and, and that's the thing of trying to emphasize, this is important, and then this is important, and this is important, and this is important. And at a certain point where everything's important, nothing's important anymore. Um, so um, now we're gonna, just so we can finish intimidating people in a silly way, um, <laughs> here, here's a typical, Here's a typical page that Karen provided from a well-written article. And you can see here um, on the right-hand side, this shows all the um, instances in which uh, Karen has um, made a bit of an edit here. And yeah, so um, it looks really, you look really like a really mean person here, Karen. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> yeah, let me just speak to it for a split second. So even if you take okay. out all the little formatting things, yeah. There's between 15 and 20 edits would be pretty average for a decently written article yeah. for me. And then the notes on the right are often addressed to Tim. It's a very collaborative process for us. Right. So this is was really a better than average article in terms of all of the above. And, and later on in this article, I moved a whole paragraph as well. So yeah. just to let you know, you know, yeah, I am mean. There you go. I'm mean. No, you're not mean at all. It, it's 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 a polishing kind of process, like um, combing your hair or or other kinds of things. It's a series of small refinements, and uh, I think one of the things we want to encourage people to do in, in today's session is come up with some things that motivate you to get moving. And part of the thing that should actually give you freedom is realization that you don't have to come up with the finished product on the first run at it. And even after you've gone through a, um, a couple drafts and, and feel better about it and send it to us, know that it will get better from there because we're going to work with you on it. And, and as soon as you change the psychology from thinking, you know, these words are my children, that whole kind of <laughs> um, nonsense that you are somehow identified with this, but you put it out as, a, um, as an object that we're all working on together. There's, there's a, a, a real shift in the tension there, and it becomes um, not from having to justify ourselves, but how are we all working together to uh, really serve the reader, like you said. So we've talked a little bit about copy editing. We've talked about developmental editing. We've talked about the things that we're looking to cut out. We've talked about uh, the things that we're looking to add or amplify, which I thought you um, covered really well. Um, let's just do a little bit of a visual here now on um, how um, our form might um, change a little bit depending on um, what the content is. So uh, you should be seeing on your screen here um, an article from a, a recent magazine uh, by Martin Conder. Martin has uh, given us a series of uh, wonderful articles uh, which um, intersect with his, his hobby of climbing mountains, particularly as a younger man, um, often without regards for basic safety. Um, and uh, so he sent this article in and all the text content you see here is basically his article. That's what he sent us. And so if there's any graphics on here, it's just been added to add a little bit of tone to it. So a lot of articles will be like this, if you're telling a, a story about a personal experience and you don't have any photos uh, from that time, that's fine. You just send us in uh, the article and then let the, the people doing the layout um, add a little bit more uh, interest to it. So, that, so that's a very basic version. Um, here uh, is an illustration of a couple articles here. The one on the left, a uh, technical article from our financial specialist, Mike Burton. The one on the right, part of a wonderful series of articles by Norman Gledo, where he talked about environmental concerns. And here, uh, we really want to highlight 
that um, there are instances where your article will have technical details and technical details don't work so well um, in a narrative form, Karen. They, they, it's hard to have a paragraph where you're just absorbing all those things. And that's where you wanna start looking at maybe using bullets and tabular data. And so let's uh, zoom in here first to our financial article. And you can see here, he's done that in two different ways. Here is our list a list of think considerations that you have to uh, consider when you're talking about your the deductibility of financial planner fees. Um, so that, that's gonna be hard to, to read as a paragraph. So he's broken that out as bullet points, becomes very easy to follow. And then here's a, another interesting example. We have a comparison of two different methods, the indirect method and the direct method. And when you're comparing two series of data, then it's really helpful to use this tabular format and it becomes easy for people to scan. Uh, I think one of the uh, other aspects of this, I'll invite you to comment on this, Karen, is that our readers will have different learning styles of what they're gonna get out of a, an article and, and these format changes can help. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I have taken um, chunks of data and turned it into bullet points much more than once for just yeah. this reason. And then it also helps um, just within the article to have these different pieces in terms of people's attention, just brain level attention, both because of the different learning styles and actually for all of us, shifting to the, the, not so much the tone, but the sort of the shape of the information from long to short. Um, and also very often the, the extra words around the things that become bullet points aren't really essential to what people need to, to get from the Yeah, article. they can almost be a distraction from the one thing you're yeah, trying to communicate. Exactly. So stripping away all that narrative and, and just getting into data when you're only trying to communicate data is really effective. So here, let's zoom in now on Norman's article. And here again, we have a comparison of two states of being here. Um, so here's his, his consumption of uh, carbon or, you know, in, in a particular year, 2016, 17, and then two or three years later when he's moved this. So he's got a lot of these um, concepts covered here in the text above. You'll see he, he's got some data here that's appropriate. The, the average North American diet produces 2,500 kilograms of carbon dioxide per person per year, which is a bit shocking, but that's a standalone fact. So it fits inside the, the, the text. And when he starts doing the comparison again, including formulas, and this is all pretty dense stuff, maybe too dense, but um, he, he's doing these items that end up with a sum total. So that's where the tabular data is gonna be very uh, effective way to, um, do this. And so um, here, Karen, again, we have that a very personal story going on, and then he pulls out the data at the, the right point to make it effective. Yeah, and in the editing process with articles like this, Tim or I, now it's usually me, may well send you a note saying, can you give us a chart? Can you give us uh, a sidebar, some items for a sidebar? Yeah. Um, yeah. I have a background in research, so I can do it, but I'll always ask the writer first if they want to, to do it for their article. Because again, providing the information in that more tabular format works better for some readers and in certain ways works for all readers to help them actually absorb what's going on. Yeah, now I, th there's one area where I wouldn't consider tabular data being really helpful and that's in a poem. <laughs> um, unless someone here is inspired to write a, uh, a poem using tabular data, that would be very creative, um, potentially, and you may win the Nobel Prize for Literature from science teachers. I don't know. Uh, but here's an article from uh, Paul Desjardins, who's a wonderful photographer and, and most of all, a wonderful thinker. And this is from uh, a couple issues ago, I think the spring issue. And what he's done here is very creatively... Um, he submitted uh, his photos over here, which we've arranged together. And then we let the, the poem stand on its own on this page. 
So one of the things that's fun for us as, as we put the magazine together is we start to think of compositing these different pieces as page spreads. And you'll often find now that uh, uh, an article will lead off with a strong uh, hero image, we call it, on the opening page. And then we, and that sets the, the emotional tone for the article. And so here we've got the, the poem on the left, which is uh, a wonderful, witty little tribute to the, the, um, the voices of birds compared to the, the visual experience of experiencing colors. And uh, to, speaking about tone here, um, what do you think about this title for the poem, Karen? If bird could tweet colors. I think it's great. I mean, it catches the tone of the whole um, thing and it's a pun. <laughs> It, it's a pun. It's a pun not only in our um, technological word because we think of tweeting um, right. as as something else, but it's it sets that kind of whimsical tone that he has. And and uh, what is so effective to me about this is um, is that he ends up landing that poem um, in a, in an emotional space that actually really you know hits home. You really feel like you've touched something. Uh, and uh, the combination of the words and the text is wonderful. So thank you to uh, Paul Desjardins for that uh, illustration. One of the questions we get quite often is, what's my deadline? So let's, I'm just going to show on the screen here some of the, the basic points that will be helpful for people. Um, depending on the issue, uh, it's going to be a, a deadline date. And th this is also on page four of every magazine in the fine print there underneath the masthead. Uh, you'll see that. So our next issue is, uh, that we're producing now will be the fall issue. And uh, if you're interested in uh, uh, submitting for that, please have your article in by July 15th. If not uh, that one, then the next one after that is uh, the winter issue and that'll be October 31. If you've got something that's topical to a season, here's a hint. Uh, if you've got something about a winter activity, um, send it for the fall issue at the earliest and the winter issue. Don't submit it for the spring issue because that won't, won't be helpful to the readers. So uh, something to think about that way. Uh, file formats. Uh, a lot of us are getting better at technology, but it's always helpful to know. Uh, we prefer to get things in Microsoft Word format uh, or an RTF or PDF, or you could do it as a text file. Uh, one that gives us a bit more trouble is Apple's pages format that we don't like that as much. It, it creates some grief for us. So it'll just make our job a bit easier if you submit it in one of those formats. We have from once in a while received a handwritten submission and it will be considered based on its merits, but uh, um, it is easier if we get it in a simple format. Uh, also, one of the things under the category of trying too hard is trying to put fancy fonts or really unusual formatting in your, in your, what you submit to us, um, that actually is something we have to take out to, to work with it. So um, simpler is better. And the next question is images, photos, um, just send us the biggest version you have. Don't necessarily try to edit it a lot. Um, and I'll show you some images um, later on, both in Duncan's and Linda's articles. And we can talk a little bit about how they support uh, the effectiveness of, of an article. Uh, word counts. Let's talk a little bit about word count, Karen. Um, can you tell if an article is good or not by the word count when it arrives? No, not at all. Yeah. Not at all. I mean, some, some articles need, uh, we almost always end up cutting at least some words, but some articles need more detail and need to be longer. Some we most we wind up shortening at least a little bit, but not always. Um, it's not unusual for an article to wind up a bit longer. Uh, so it's does the word count? I think of it as punch. I think that does the word count the punch fit the word count? So you know, or or you could think of it as weight. Is this a, a four hundred word weight article or a two thousand word weight article? And um, and that's again, that's fitting the kind of form in terms of the word numbers to how much is coming across through those words. Right. I guess down in Texas, they say, oh, that guy's all hat, no cattle. 
And um, <laughs> sometimes, sometimes that's the case. You, you, you get a really huge article that goes on in every, goes to every labyrinth um, that could possibly be associated with it. But, you know, there's no there there or, or, or it's lost in there and you have to excavate it. So I think that leads us to the next point on the screen there, which is what say, is your sense? Yeah, go ahead. Say about words. What I don't want to do at this point is frighten people. <laughs> Write it for yourself initially. Yes. Set it aside for a couple of days and then edit it yourself. But I don't want you deciding not to work out of fear over this issue because we're not afraid to edit out words. <laughs> Yeah, and and yeah, you don't want to have it so thin that there's nothing there, and we have to have to do that. So I think the the positive way to put it is, what is your central focus, and how can you expand on that? So, um, how in your mind, uh, you know, you, you're a writer as well, Karen. Um, when you're thinking about establishing a central focus, um, how, what thoughts go through your mind? Does that coalesce instantly or does it take, take time to develop? Tell me about that. It, well, this links to the idea of using kind of more novelistic techniques, I think. Very often when I start to write, I just, I write my way to understanding in a first draft. And Tim has read some of my writing. And it's very often that I just have this sense that some things in my life are linked. And then after I've written the first draft, I go, oh, there it is. But then I have to go back through and strengthen that link. And just to mention the only article I've had in the magazine, the Josephine Tay article, that certainly happened with that article even, which was quite a factual article about another writer, um, which by the way, Tim had to edit. <laughs> so, you know, everybody gets edited. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I think it can work that way. I think on a more informative things that I've done, I know what the point I'm trying to get across. So it can go either way. Um, the main point is that by the time you turn it in, you as the writer should have a sense of, of what that, that main thing is. And then you can pull it up. And Tim's gonna give you some examples from, um, from the two writers that we're talking about, about the pulling out of a theme or of small things, small touches that you can sort of tap into all the way through an article. Um, so yeah, it can go either way. As long as by the time we see it, we, we can get a sense of what your central. Yeah. And, and, and a, a really strong, um, article or a really powerful experience will have more than one element in it. It won't be some kind of purified, um, uh, thing sitting in a test tube that only has one thing in it. Right. It's going to have a number of different elements. And here, I don't have it to show on the screen, but I'll just put this. This is an article that came in. Uh, it is in our latest um, magazine. And I'm just going to read the title to you because you can't, can't read that. Um, so you, if you haven't heard this, um, talk about breaking the rules of focus. The title of this article is Zen and the Art of Being Stuck in Bangkok During the Pandemic with Your Husband Who Has Stage 4 Cancer. Um, so <laughs> there's a few themes going on there. Uh, but Vivian Morris, um, and you can see um, just the typography that we've used there. We've tried to show the confusion of that experience of being stuck in Bangkok during the pandemic by merging all the words into one long blob. And the only differentiation is in the color of, of, of each word. So visually just showing that, that kind of chaotic thing. But what Vivian does uh, quite well in that article, and you'll, you'll see when you get that in your mailbox, um, is she shows the different emotional layers of, of this experience. So um, there's a fair amount of intuition going on um, when it comes to the question of um, tone and, and so on. So um, just to wrap up this section, Karen, we're happy to uh, receive queries on articles and we'll coach people a little bit and give them some uh, encouragement and, and sense of where we think uh, might go and they can just email us postscript at bcrta.ca. And so um, that brings uh, this initial section of our uh, presentation to a close. Thank you, Karen, for joining. I'll, I'll invite you to come back a little bit later and uh, join us uh, for, for our questions if we have time. So let's uh, move on now to uh, interviewing a couple of very interesting people, your, your compatriots in this adventure of writing. 
Uh, we have two guests today, Duncan Lowe and Linda Grace Philipson. And I'm going to um, just introduce Duncan here by coaching you folks a little bit on what you can look for in our conversation and in our uh, samples of his writing here. Uh, because Duncan very effectively in his article, Slow Fire, um, demonstrates a lot of things we've been talking about today. Uh, Duncan won the Postscript Excellence Award for his article about uh, building a wood-fired oven. And here's some things to watch for in his article. Duncan does a super job of not only explaining why he did what he did, but also how he did it. And those two things together uh, make for uh, a really fun article to read. Uh, you'll see that he has a number of different elements in his article. Uh, he mixes the different formats. We've talked about using tabular data and uh, narrative. He does that really effectively. And he has some great supporting photos that, that bring the article to life. And um, as we may even experience <laughs> now, uh, Duncan is uh, one of those uh, super guys who's fun to talk to, and he adds a little bit of humor to things. So, Duncan, I'll ask you to turn your microphone on and and uh, welcome to our workshop today. Good morning, Tim. Yeah, it's it's terrific to talk with you again. I always enjoy um, talking with you about um, life in general, um, but also about um, the process of, of writing. So you had um, a, a quite profound experience, it seems to me, uh, around this issue of the wood-fired oven. And um, one of the things that, that highlighted in the article here, we can see our opening page here on the left-hand side with our hero image. Um, you didn't provide that image. We, we, we needed a, a, a bigger image, so we used that. But What's interesting to me is the opening sentence that um, we settled on here. You, you really highlight the, the need that, that started this. And it wasn't just a need for a particular kind of food or warmth. Um, the sentence is, it first arose as a resistance to fast food. And it goes on, I began to dislike the beep of the microwave. So can you talk a little bit about um, that overall experience that got you thinking about this process and you brought out in your article? I think the thought process in part had to do with, I'm always looking, I guess, to improve where and how I'm living. Retirement gives us opportunities to think about how we can do better as well as how we could have done better perhaps. But mm -hmm. for me, it was looking at frustrations and I'm the sort of person, if I see some kind of problem, almost immediately I want to act on it. How can I fix that problem? So that really was the start. Yeah, and what's interesting about the way you phrase that is um, most people would think of a microwave as a solution to a problem, right? Like, because you now don't quote unquote waste any time, but you were talking about a different kind of problem. <laughs> well, I think it's true that we lived fast and furious as teachers, the whole world revolved around how quickly we could get food on the table for our kids or get out the door at breakfast time and so on. So if, when there's time to do things differently, you also have time to see, you know, there is better tasting food. And of course, what provo provoked me was there's better tasting bread out there too. Right, right. And, and you highlight that here. And I'll just show the, the next page here. Uh, you highlight here the the what you call the holy grail of bread. Tell me about the holy grail of bread. Well, I, I think anybody who then embarks on trying to be a baker begins to realize there is an entire world of information out there about how to do it, despite the fact that it's been done thousands of years, right? And I, I learned about the competitions that take place, for instance, in Paris to determine who is the very best baker of the baguettes. And at any particular time, I bet you could find out at least eight or nine of them claiming that they are the very best. So, so that was the interest right there, knowing that everybody's trying to do it better. It was an intriguing puzzle to try to solve too. Yeah, and, and 
Um, I think the other thing that really jumps out at me in, in our conversation so far is that you're talking about a quality of life for yourself now in retirement where you're setting your own terms. I, I think that's true. And maybe the answer is I'm setting my own terms by the goals, which is mm, what else can I do to live better? <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Now, now we talked about um, having a, a bunch of different themes over on the left hand side of the page here early in the article, you can see that uh, might be hard for people to read, but um, you introduced this paragraph by hearkening way back to that ancient tradition of bread making in, the, in Egypt and the Romans. And so you, you get the sense that you're joining into something that's very grand and big and important, a very important part of civilization. And then you immediately undercut it with this funny little comment. A friend suggested that I look at Adobe ovens and that I could, Tom Sawyer like, invite some neighbors to help me build a cob oven. So uh, I think most of our listeners here will remember uh, Tom Sawyer's work method. Um, talk a little bit about that and, and that delightful little touch of humor that you've got there. I think I, I could explain where the the sense of humor comes in because of course when you realize you can just go to the grocery store and bake a loaf of bread um, or buy a loaf of bread or bake it simply in your home oven right at its base that's a particularly hilariously silly idea right, so, right. and especially yeah. if you intend to spend large amounts of time as it turned out far more time and effort and money than i had ever anticipated there's also that self-awareness at the whole all the time that i'm really doing a very silly and transparently foolish thing and i would think well okay transparently foolish reminds me of Tom Sawyer and <laughs> all the various things that uh, a skillful manipulator could get other people to do. Right, and, because and he's, pa he's, he's painting his fence and he, 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 he tricks people into thinking that this is such an enjoyable thing that they should participate in. And this is what you did, is it not? Did you not trick your neighbors into helping you? I did not. <laughs> it, <laughs> it, it, it looked... Mm, as a, at a closer and closer examination to be hmm, disreputable and foolish. How's that? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so uh, one of the funny things about that, that um, the way you play with the humor of that is you introduce this Tom Sawyer idea that you're going to get everybody else to do the work for you. But what ends up happening in a, in a kind of heartwarming way is you, you show that your oven wasn't a burden to your neighbors. It became something else. And that, I have to say, was completely unexpected, although I did visit a, a couple of other examples that other people reasonably locally had built. It had more to do with uh, being picky enough and wanting to be able to do it myself. I, I hadn't realized the, the appeal that it was going to have. It was really very much a, a personal and private obsession to begin with until right. others began to want to get involved as well. Yeah, and so so once your ovens fired up, in fact, it became a gathering place for people from your neighborhood. Even from the beginning, at the very first efforts to try and pour concrete, and anybody who's done it knows it's, it's tedious, hard work to do in a hurry. And yeah. many of my neighbors, it's a tradition within the neighborhood. We help each other out fairly regularly at all kinds of difficult tasks from, you know, gathering firewood to plowing driveways and all the rest of it. Yeah. And so, so um, I, I found that very interesting um, that um, you call it a private obsession, but it became really a, a something that by its very nature, you, you ended up sharing with other people. Oh, quite right. And that perhaps, again, is part of the the unexpected pleasure and certainly not foreseen to begin with. It was very personal at the beginning and now is a very public connection in all sorts of ways. Yeah. And so let's let's look at some uh, further pages on here. And 
Um, over on the left-hand side, um, you'll see where we've used some of Duncan's photos here. And I just want to highlight one thing. Um, these top two photos very effectively, they focus in here on um, one particular element that he's showing here. The top is a piece of bread or a, a loaf of bread and some butter. And uh, here, one of the lovely pizzas on a peeler. I know what a peeler is now, Duncan, thanks okay. to your article. Um, <laughs> So um, that's good. But one of the things I often find is that people submit photos where everything's filling the whole frame of the photo. And what I love about this photo in the lower left here is that the oven isn't just filling the whole frame. You set it in the context of your backyard. So from a layout point of view, it gives us some interesting options. We now have all this space up here where we can put this uh, lovely little pull quote in here. And it's a little bit more restful to the eye. You're, you're not crowding everything in. So just one hint, when you send in photos or you're taking photos of something, um, send in a variety that, in, that includes um, a bit of a, a context and some space. Uh, it's easier for us to process. And, and I think, Duncan, this visual really shows um, the context of your your oven in in your whole living environment and particularly with the living wood behind and the 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 cut wood um, chopped up here uh it, it, it's effective now i i think one of the brilliant things that you did here um and you started with this idea um duncan so i give you 100 percent credit for this um karen and i are often in inviting people to create a, a, what we call a sidebar, you know, a factual insert that goes in to support the narrative of the story. And you came up with a kind of recipe uh, with ingredients, not to make a food item, but here the ingredients are making a wood-fired oven, starting with eight bags of concrete. Uh, <laughs> that's your first ingredient. So talk a little bit about the thinking of, uh, of how you came up with that idea? Well, I guess I would say at any point, um, past life as a teacher, and I'm sure others have this experience, at some point I was an editor for some other publications um, within the school and school district and so on. So amongst the writing I do is to think for the editor and try to feel sympathetic to the editor and and give him and her do what they can do best start with the pyramid which is the important things first and then taper down so that lesser details can be extracted or painlessly cut from any article anyway so i look at and say okay what could i provi provide which would be additional information if the editor wishes to shorten the article or expand it as need be. So yeah. uh, when I look at it, of course, that was a good opportunity to provide a, what would you call it? A little bit of a threat and a little bit of humor. Somebody <laughs> reading that, how many bags of concrete and how many hundreds of bricks did this take? <laughs> and that might give someone a sober second thought, you know? Yeah, well, <laughs> you, you're, I see that once again, you're trying to escape responsibility, but that's okay. Um, the, the, what you've done very effectively here, though, and, and just in the way you're describing it now, again, you're inserting humor to a very practical element. And I think that's one of the genius of this article is that you're giving people the practical advice. You're actually giving them the data, but you're doing it in a way that's a little bit sly and a little bit fun. And if, if you read the um, instructions here again, we have this wonderful theme here where the, the careful reader will see Mark Twain and he's, then he'll, um, he or she will think back, oh, he already mentioned Tom Sawyer, what's that about? And then here it is, reread Mark Twain to learn how to get others to pay defense. Um, and even better than that uh, is the sentence that leads in there before, build curiosity by being mysteriously secretive. Well, no, this is just nonsense. This has nothing to do with anything, Duncan. But it's so effective because it's creating that whole um, that whole wonderful interface between you and your neighbors, which which I think is quite great. Well, you're very kind, and I think you do expose part of the underpinning, as I said to begin with, 
quite aware that I was undertaking a, a totally pointless, hilarious experience in one way, and I and then still wanted to be able to inform others, and especially anybody who might say, oh, that looks like a good idea, I might like to do it. I, I want to sort of wave my finger and say, yes, but be forewarned, don't yeah. blame me. <laughs> yeah. It turns out to be much more than you planned. Yeah, uh, it may not have been said to you before, but I'll say it to you now. You're no Pollyanna. Um, so let's go on to uh, the next uh, thing, which is which is uh, just focusing in on those photos here. And these are really effective photos to support your article as well, because here we have a sequence of events and it's just very visual. It just brings it right home. And um, here you are at the beginning of the process, still grinning. I don't know if you're grinning by the end, but um, very effective. And so for me, as a, as I'm compositing this article to publish, um, all of this tracks back to that other photo that we showed where it was finished sitting in the forest with the snow on it. Um, here it is in that same context, bit by bit, uh, being built. And it's a kind of emotionally satisfying as a reader to, to see all that come full circle. Now, when you were um, taking these photos, did you have an idea that you were going to write about it or was that just kind of happenstance? Oh, I, I don't think I was thinking at all about um, writing about it. Uh, it was some strong encourage, um, encouragement from other sources caused me to write about it, but uh, it was very much a case by the time I was busy, I knew that other people were interested at how various problems could be solved in, in that construction process. And I give full, full photo credit to my wife, Leslie, who in, insisted that a record be kept of what I've been doing with oh, my time no. for the last two months. <laughs> it, it's always good to credit your spouse. Uh, that's, that's, that's good. And um, yeah, very well done. So really, um, this article, I think, is a wonderful example of mining personal experience and um, disclosing something of yourself and at the same time uh, being of a practical coach. Um, did you, you've already highlighted this, um, but maybe I'll ask you about it again. Is there something that maybe teachers are best suited to do um, in, in writing this way? I, I think so, uh, probably. Um, I think Karen said to begin, the most important part of the process is thinking about your reader was any teacher can look at a classroom and say who are the people that I'm trying to reach what are their needs or their understandings or their limitations and so yeah I think if you're writing and begin by thinking who is my audience and what do I have to do to reach them that's a really important skill I would argue for any writer. Yeah, yeah, well said. And uh, I have to say, uh, there's not that many articles that uh, I had that have such a wonderful combination of the practical, the humorous, and the philosophical, because you're talking about a way of life and, and, and a way of taking life on board. And uh, it's just a joy to uh, encounter that, Duncan. You're very kind. I hope I can sell that. Enjoy every day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, that's terrific. Well, Duncan, we, we will uh, say thank you to you. And uh, if someone has a question for you later, maybe we'll uh, um, invite you back. Um, but uh, thanks so much for uh, sharing about your experience today. We appreciate it very much. Thank you, Tim. Okay. Well, that was uh, quite something. And I'm uh, very happy to introduce our, our next writer. Linda uh, Grace Phillipson, who is, um, I think she's quite experienced at writing. She would, she would agree with me on that, I think. And uh, Linda has written a series of articles about her travel to Japan um, to learn traditional flower arrangement. At least that's the premise of the article. Sometimes I think the article is more about what's going on inside Linda's own mind uh, than the experience of the flower arranging, but we'll talk about that. And things that I'd encourage you to watch for as we talk about uh, Linda's articles is that she does a really effective job of setting a personal context. 
um, she has a narrative where the stakes are high. And um, we were kind of joking before we got the workshop going that flower arranging wouldn't necessarily seem to be um, high stakes endeavor, but uh, Linda shows that it can be. She also has some wonderful supporting photos. And uh, one of the things I really like about um, working with Linda is her articles really have a, a terrific uh, sense of resolution. She sets up um, points and then uh, resolves them really wonderfully in the article. So Linda, if, if you can turn your microphone on, I'm, I'm really happy to welcome you to our workshop this morning. Thank you, Tim, and uh, well, hi to everybody else. Well, it's um, one of the exciting things about working with um, you, Linda, is that you really have uh, writing that brings a point of view. And, mm -hmm. and the, you know, Karen was talking about the tone and the voice and, and, you know, that sense of presence of the writer. And I think people who are listening to this call might find it kind of odd or surprising that it doesn't necessarily start out for you that way, that like all kinds of people, you have your own way of working and, and sometimes it seems like a jumble and you don't know where to start. So can you talk a little bit about how you find that your brain works best and the approach that you take to uh, get started on an article? Sure. Um, first of all, you, uh, I have to have some kind of experience to go on. And then secondly, I really understand how my brain works. I know that I'm a very balanced, uh, abstract, random, and concrete sequential. I am abstract, random by preference, but over time, I have really learned to become very concrete sequential in, in getting a job done. It really helps as a teacher, for sure. Yeah. And as a writer, it does as well. But I then know that I have to get out of my own way um, and I have to deal with the way things come. If I'm writing a how to go to certain place and have a certain kind of experience, then I can pull to the concrete sequential side and I can do my numerical outline with the um, key points and the subordinate points. And then I can go tick, 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 tick down the thing and, you know, wrap it up. Whereas, um, other things are much more difficult because they seem to come in rather randomly. And then I tend to look at them as, for those of you who uh, sew, as a crazy quilt. The pieces are all different sizes and um, you're not necessarily getting um, a block, you know, that is really sort of set. And then you have to look for ways of connecting them and stitching them together by making transitions. So. Um, to do that, I do a lot of writing on post-it notes because I would get all my great ideas driving to school. And <laughs> How <laughs> convenient. Would, yeah, really. So I'd be pulling over and I'd be filling up a pad of post-it notes and then sticking on the dashboard because if I didn't write it down, by the end of the day, the idea was gone. So then I come back and do the kind of like, oh, that's what I was thinking this morning. And it was all back. And then because it was all out of order and it was just this jumble of things, I could apply something that I learned from a student teacher. And I warned her, I says, you know, the principal is gonna, you know, tweak the timetable and then your lesson plan is gonna be all for naught. So be aware that you need to do that. So she put her whole unit in a file folder that could be spread out with post-it notes that could be moved around to the days. And I went, brilliant. And I started to write that way. Uh, I could move these post-it notes around and I could shuffle things. And so I've also sometimes used taping and transcribing. If I'm traveling and I'm just too tired to write something, I have a little digital recorder and I can just yap into it and, and pull from that. And um, so that's kind of, I'm sort of all over the place. And then I don't write in order either. Um, I really can't start an article, you know, and flow it from A to B until I have the first sentence. It leaps into my mind on a day and then it's there and then I can write. But that doesn't mean I wait for that. I write all the other little supporting bits that I know I'm going to get to, but I don't have my beginning. So just to be clear, you're, you're, you're working on it in terms of 
brainstorming and assembling those post-it notes yeah. and, and things come to mind. This is important and this is important. I'm not sure mm-hmm. how they're linked yet, mm-hmm. but I know that they're somehow associated. But the point at which you seem to be able to start pulling things together is when you identify that opening Opening moment. sentence, yeah. And I compare it a little bit to cooking. There are some people who get everything mise en place and you've got all your little crucibles filled with your salt and your baking powder and all that, and then you start putting it together. And you've got somebody else who is a writer who um, does a random, you get to a certain point in a recipe and you realize, oh, I don't have this ingredient. So you have to go to the store. Then you meet somebody at the store and it takes half an hour to catch up with them. <laughs> and <laughs> meanwhile, then you have to get back to your recipe. Oh, okay. So um, it, it's quite random in, in both ways. Right. So um, before we get too random ourselves and, and right. move off from this, I want to talk a little bit about this opening here. And this is the, the opening spread from uh, the very first article in the series about Ikebana. And um, I'd like to zoom in here on this um, initial paragraph, and I'm just going to uh, read it out. As my three-month Tokyo adventure drew to a close, I walked home along Aoyama Dori. The setting January sun gilded the glass facades of buildings. The normally gray towers glowed gold. I did too, quite on fire with exhilaration. So, um, Linda, this is for a concrete linear person that you were bragging about being, this seems like the strangest place to start the article and it's enormously effective. What you're doing is you're talking about a feeling you had at the very end of that experience as a way of introducing the uh, article. Can you talk a little bit about um, why a writer would do that and the, and the psychology of what you're doing by setting it up that way? Well, I learned that from someone else and I wish I could credit the person who did that writer's workshop. But what they suggested was to identify a really intense moment and then start with that moment because, and I hate to use the word hook because that sounds very manipulative, but you're going to engage the reader and bring them into your emotional state. And, you know, the buildings were golden. It was the end of the day. I was tired and I was golden. And, you know, and then the, the workshop leader said, don't forget to bring it back to the beginning. And in the following sentences, I go back to how that got started and then go where the headline says beginnings and how did that all transpire? So he says, you always have to remember where you start. You have to take, if you're doing a flashback or a flash ahead, you have to bring people out of that into the present to where your article can flow again. And that was really valuable advice. And that's, I think, most helpful for someone who goes abstract random very easily. Yeah, and I think um, it particularly is effective uh, in, in terms of the articles where you want an emotional payoff to happen. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. Because it really, um, it, it creates that payoff moment by setting the context for, you know, this is the theme, this is what mm-hmm. we're dealing with, this is, you know, how deep this went. Um, mm-hmm. and, and then as the components come together, um, like, yeah. like good movie making, quite often you'll, yeah. you'll, you'll, you'll see uh, something presented at the beginning and then we'll, we'll move back right. in the story. And in a sense, I don't use the words, but it's a spiritual experience as well. And I don't like to kind of be pedantic about stuff like that. I like to let people who can feel it, feel it. And if you don't feel it that way, if you don't interpret it that way, I don't have to. Um, bang anybody over the head with you know my philosophical um, kind of insight at that moment yeah and what what's good is you don't have bullet points of these were my philosophical insights you it's (laughs) it's it's associative it's poetic you're 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 immersing people in that description of that that Mm -hmm. glowing environment and that that yeah that you had um I think the uh, the other phrase that I wanted to highlight before we move on to um, our next series of points was something you said right at the beginning, which was, I thought was really interesting. Get out of my own way. 
And I think that has to do with right brain and left brain would be a technical way to put it or our uh, creative associative mind versus the editor. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. you've been a teacher, you've, you've done a lot of experience, so you know how to edit and cut things out. Um, but we kind of have to shut that off in the early stages, don't we? Yes. And again, um, most uh, coaches will say, write a crappy first draft without stopping. Just write, write, write. Don't correct any spelling. And, you know, it's bad because Google will underline every or Word will underline everything for you. And we tend to get stuck on that because we want to be right. And Mm -hmm. we spend a lot of energy teaching kids how to be right. And so I think it's hard to turn that off. And I have a compromised relationship with that. Um, I do it about 80% that I just write and I do a 20% of this and that because I also know my own mind that if I get a thought in the middle of that, I'm going to lose it if I keep going. So I just throw down square brackets or a little highlight and I just type that other stuff in fast and then I keep going. So I've kind of learned my own way of doing that yeah. uh, so that I don't lose my good thoughts, just like the post-it notes in the car. Because if I go further, it's gone. And I don't have to go very much further for it to be absolutely gone. Right. Um, then, um, But it's really important, I think, to just not worry about the correctness of it. And then I also write on only one side of the paper if I'm printing it if I'm using the computer rather than handwriting either way I write on only one side of the paper because then I can cut it up and move it around I don't see things too well on a scroll and a computer is a scroll and so once it disappears it's gone whereas if it's an open page then I can see it and I have a sense of it more because I'm more physical about it rather than having it all ethereally in my mind so, well, this sounds like you, you're, you're set up in terms of your cognitive setup. You really are a flower arranger kind of person in the sense that you're actually physically snipping paper. And, and mm-hmm. the idea of post-it notes, taking these elements and yeah. posting them in certain order and cutting up page to pages of your first draft and reorganizing things. I mean, that's a very a, a much like an arrangement kind of uh, model. Well, uh, thank you for that, because I hadn't even sort of perceived it in that way. And that uh, segues really well into the structure of writing, which is um, balanced, and it is formulaic in certain respects. Well, and tell me so, about the formulas. What, what, that term, formulas well, sound constrictive, but I've got a feeling from reading what you've written that it doesn't well, turn out to be restrictive at all. No, well, you've got to have a beginning, a middle, and an end. And in Ikebana, you have a sheen and a soy and a hikai. And they come in at different angles. And according to what you are creating, whether it's a slanting style or whether it's in a suiban or in, a, uh, in another kind of vase, these all have guidelines. And then within that, you also have freestyle. So in freestyle, you can break all those rules, which you were mentioning when we talked earlier about um, the writer who was writing, oh, Leslie Davidson, uh, dancing in small spaces in the recent issue on page 30. Um, She does this all the time, like it's really free form. Yeah. But there is such a structure underneath that. She's breaking all the rules, but she knows what those rules are. So that way, writing is very much like Ikebana. And back to Ikebana, at the beginning, you are really held strictly to forms. You know, and I used to resist like crazy um, having to teach students to write a five paragraph essay. And I would tell them, you only have to do this for the government exam. So learn it and learn how to pull it off well and then do what you want. You know, um, you, you, you have to recognize that certain strictures at the beginning, you'll be more adept at sort of sticking to them if, and then learning all the rules. I mean, it's like Perlman said the same thing about playing the violin. He says, I know all the rules, so I can break all the Bach rules you want, I want. 
right i do right. all the time yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh yeah and, and and there's that tension of playing with expectations because we do have yeah. certain set of expectations mm-hmm. of, of of form when we were talking with duncan we talked about there's an expectation that there's a a recipe and a formula and when you put some little humor in there that's a surprise mm-hmm. to you because you don't that's not usually exactly exactly yeah. and in certain kinds of articles i mean if you're strictly doing a you know you're doing an information dump you know you might not find the vehicle for being super creative but right re- you can still as um you, you pointed out you know the recipe for um building that oven that that was very clever yeah now one of the things i think you do very effectively is that you set up the emotional stakes and then you should set up this sense of becoming aware of this very defined structure it's very japanese mm-hmm. way of thinking with these all these rules that that your part of your emotional journey is counting rule after rule after rule after rule mm-hmm. that that that's kind of overwhelming and so what you model so beautifully in those all three of those articles is that you take us sequentially through the steps that are happening in you know in the classroom mm-hmm. but you're tracking your emotions through that as well and so it's two mm-hmm. different journeys in one and mm-hmm. um did that does that just happen or or do you consciously build those twisted or that braided kind of narrative together well i journal almost everything and so um, I started a journal for my um, Ikebana lessons as well. And I'm so glad I did because in the absence of being able to go to uh, Tokyo during the pandemic and things like that, I went back to my journals and I read those and I read my teacher's critiques, but I also taught self-assessment to my students. So when a teacher didn't sort of make a big to do about all the things I had done well, I went in there and did that. And I think I revealed that in my article. And so that way I could keep my confidence up because Japanese pedagogy is very different from Western pedagogy. And and this is important for writers to know too, at that criticism is not a destruction of you know your beautiful thing. Um, criticism is value added to what you have created and I had to learn that because nobody actually told me that that was the Japanese system that you would get criticism and then if you would fix it you would get criticized again on something else (laughs) because you were your your teacher was seeing his responsibility or her responsibility to add more value to what you were doing so (laughs) you know that so, so there's a real parallel between those. So in, in terms yeah. of you, now you're, you're an experienced writer. You've been published in a number of places. And mm-hmm. what what about your experience then with that dialogue with the editor? Um, how does that go? Is it as much of an emotional roller coaster for you now as it maybe was? Or how does that it, go? It can be. Um, every editor is different. Um, some editors, I think, like to mess with copy. And I was warned by when I was writing for the Vancouver Sun and when I was writing for the Globe and Mail, I was warned by other writers on staff writers and I was freelancing. um, Which editors had which kinds of approaches and help to know that in advance. So but if you don't, if you're just pitching articles and, and stuff, you learn as you go along. The only editors I resent are the ones who put mistakes into my work. And that has <laughs> happened. <laughs> yeah, I can I've see had that. I have to write back and correct them and say, no, this is not pronoun agreement the way you have rephrased it. <laughs> you know, but um, I can do that. But no, it's generally, I mean, with you and Karen, it's been super respectful and stuff. And and I used to love the Globe and Mail because, I mean, those those two guys, Jack and um, oh, what's the other guy's name? Um, Marvin. Uh, or Martin Levin, I think. Anyway, they hardly ever touched my work. They they just let it be. And I thought, oh, that's great. If they think it's great, then I think it's great. And then the one time I got, like, this is a rather convoluted sentence. <laughs> yeah, it is. You know, so you, you've got to be that kind of repartee with an editor that is nice. 
Yeah. Yeah. If the, the trust is sort of the currency that's going to make mm-hmm. it work or not Absolutely. work. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Uh, if, if the, if the editors decided that, that he's going to write his article over top of yours, that, that's probably not going to be received very well. No, and that hasn't happened uh, that somebody's really tried to rewrite my article. But um, there have been times where I have not been pleased with the way something was printed. And I take that really seriously, mm-hmm. you know, because I work very hard at it. I'm actually, I once I get my, you know, draft and have it, you know, my beginning, middle and end, it's the editing of it. I obsess over it. And um, it's a joy for me to do that. It, you know, maybe borders on a disorder, but I don't care. It's fun. <laughs> it's like alcohol, you know. <laughs> well, well, I think hopefully better results than that. Um, yeah. One of the things when we, you and I were talking about um, this workshop before, you used the phrase, um, and because we're writers, we're going to mix all our metaphors here, um, yeah. uh, Linda. But one of the um, metaphors you used. Uh, um, about making your article more effective or or hitting with the reader, use the phrase underpainting. Oh, so let's talk about underpainting and what you meant by that. Yeah, underpainting is adding the sort of geographical aspects of the geographical um, uh, setting, uh, maybe uh, emotional tones like in the weather and things like that so you don't have to say how frustrated you were you know you can say that you were you know stopped on a train between two stations and lightning coming down and you know that kind of thing you and you you have to be careful with that you can't do too much but you see it in the golden buildings and walking along the street in that opening that you pointed out and that's just building to that euphoria that I was experiencing in this, you know, pre sunset moment. And, and that's an example of underpainting, putting in those kinds of details. Well, I I think one of the things too, that I appreciate about your um, writing here, and I've got this, some more pages on the screen here is um, you kind of take some personal risks here and this is just the end of it. Um, you talk about a little bit of frustration you had in your working life that you were a teacher, but being a teacher wasn't as a role, wasn't necessarily, um, you know, really expressing who you were. Mm -hmm. And so it um, being confined in that particular role really didn't necessarily suit you. You kind of got backed into that a little bit and, and you really talk, you know, in in quite an honest way about, um, arriving at retirement and saying hey am I going to be able to be really be me now and mm-hmm. I think that in a way that's a kind of underpainting yes. for for the for the stakes that, that's involved mm-hmm. in this process as well yeah that that kind of personal touch of and I've tried to be open about that without I had to be very careful to walk that fine line with not showing disrespect to my senseis in Tokyo it wasn't their fault it was my state of mind. It was my state of being, you know, when I was dealing with these frustrations and teaching was the same, you know, I got it backwards. I did a, you know, one of these workshops where you try and figure out, should you change your career? And, you know, teaching starts with people first, then um, the mind, the intellect, and then the creativity. And I was, I'm geared for the other way around, just flip that and I'm happy. And that's Ikebana, you know? Hmm. So, um, yeah, I could, this was my chance to live and be an artist, you know, like you read in those novels about people in a garret in Paris or going off <laughs> to New York, you know? This, this was my jump that I didn't get to do when I graduated from high school and that world doesn't open to me, you know? Well, uh, Linda, I have to say that th- this is exactly what I appreciate about your creativity and your sharing with uh, our readers is that you bring your whole self to it and you're not, you're not um, confining yourself only to what would be expected of you to say, that everything's great and, and you know, um, um, you're not being a Pollyanna as we, as we used that phrase no, once already. No. Um, and I think this is where, where um, readers can really take hold of it because then it's, it, you're showing respect for your peers 
by saying, I'm going to be real so you can really invest yourself in, in this as well. And I think that's a very effective way to communicate. Mm, well, thank you. Um, I mean, I'm not sure that I do it consciously. It's just sort of there. Yeah. And uh, luckily it works. <laughs> yeah, it's, it, it certainly does. And I, I have to say thank you uh, for uh, spending some time with us this morning, Linda. It's been a joy as always to speak with you. Oh, and uh, thank you for uh, sharing that writing as learning, as Karen said earlier, sometimes you write things in order to understand them. And uh, I think your articles mm -hmm. are a good example of that. And it's a real privilege to be invited into that process. So thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. And I'll send you another one soon. <laughs> okay, that's what I like to hear. Thank you. Thanks very much to uh, Linda Grace Phillipson for involvement here. So this is a new page on our website um, and it has some articles that uh, Karen and I have uh, looked at, some more articles if you're interested in different kinds of uh, articles. Uh, this gives you some coaching on uh, where you can uh, learn more about that process for those kind. Uh, we also have the writing for postscript um, um, guidelines for those uh, submissions. And I think also, if I just refresh this page, I've got some other material on here, um, some recommended books on writing, books that um, I found particularly helpful. Um, this first one will be hard to find. I think it's out of print now, but it's written in the 1930s. It was given to a friend of, to me by a friend of mine who's a novelist uh, and a nonfiction writer. Uh, and Dorothea Brand had um, a wonderful concept back in the 1920s or 30s about um, using different parts of your intellectual resources, what we would now call left brain versus right brain thinking. And uh, so her book, uh, Becoming a Writer, uh, really talks about suspending that critical side of your thinking, your editor side. Uh, while you're assembling the pieces, just as Linda mentioned, and then uh, working forward from there and shaping the material. William Zinser is a, a very effective uh, instructor on writing. Anne Lamott, if you want a philosophical approach, her bird by bird is amazing. And uh, if you want to uh, get into the mind of an editor who works with uh, um, really great writers, uh, check out John McPhee's draft number four. He was an editor for many years with the um, New Yorker magazine, and it's a really fantastic uh, uh, resource there with lots of really amazing stories. Okay, Jillian's got a good question here. Uh, Karen, I'm gonna ask you if you'll come back on uh, here and we'll uh, answer this question. How polished does an article have to be before I submit it? And what does a query look like? Well, we, we already get queries occasionally. Um, they would include questions like a topic that someone's interested in. Um, uh, one of those within the last few months, we've actually referred to, to uh, one of our other members to do an interview, for example. Um, so I think a query can literally be anything from would this topic work to something much more detailed? Like, um, I've had experience with topic X. Um, I'm thinking about framing it in this way. Does that make sense for the magazine? The thing that that does is it lets us respond and give you guidance. Um, if you know, in particular, if it's not something that you've encountered in the magazine before, then we can let you know if it's going to be appropriate, for example. And, yeah. and the answer is usually going to be yes, but then with a little bit of guidance about it, including personal um, stuff, we might give some guidance about tone. It just helps shape, really, frankly, your experience as a writer and ours as an editor so that the, the eventual article is, is what's needed. And in terms of how polished, I would say as polished as you can make it, um, though it is possible to over-edit your own work. Yeah, yeah. So you it's need to have some... There. Sometimes there, I've had people submit articles where they say, I think this is really good, but I'm worried about that. And that's a good, that's a good place to start. Um, mm. 
Um, Linda, I have a question for you from one of our uh, readers asking, uh, can you tell us what you mean by writing on one half of the page? Oh, I, I just I just mean don't write on the back. You know, everybody's, I think, conserving and recycling and doing all these environmentally sound things. I know I am, but I've learned that I can't do that if I want to cut something up. That's all. Okay, yeah. And, yeah. and I guess if, if you um, print it out and you have room to scribble more stuff on the margins and so on, I find that is a lot easier than editing on the screen as well sometimes. Absolutely. Your, your brain works differently when it's on yes. sheets. And, and each brain will work differently depending on the person. Some people will be fine on screen. And as I said earlier, I like um, concrete material to work on. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, yeah that's, yeah, that's, that's wonderful. Yeah. Karen, let's, let's talk about um, uh, writing a historical um, article. We've got a question here. What are the hints um, when I'm doing a, um, a historical article, I, I presume tracking with some kind of events, what are the things we're looking for there? Well, I would say once again, I think, and correct me, Tim, but this is just going based on what we do already, is there needs to be a, per, I'd say, first off, there has to be a personal connection for you, even if that personal connection is just how or why you got interested in this particular history or this particular figure in history. Um, it, something factual like that, do your research. And if you look at the writer's resources, several of them mentioned, you know, depending on what you're writing, make sure that you're bringing something new to the, the readers. Now, it could be that you're writing about someone who's so obscure that by definition, everything's new. Mm. But if you're going to write about somebody who isn't, uh, who is well known, then your personal connection to it or some specific aspect. And then remember, this is, you know, under typically under 2000. I see Carolyn Malm, one of our directors, has uh, thanked everyone. And she added an exclamation mark and being a little nervous about adding exclamation marks. She just wants us to know that the exclamation mark is because she's excited. Yeah. So exclamation yes. marks are allowed and that's OK. So <laughs> thanks. Thanks. Thanks for that. Uh, well, thanks so much to uh, all our participants uh, here today. Uh, it's been uh, fantastic. We've got a lot of positive comments here about uh, how uh, interesting this was and some requests to do another one. So we'll think about that. And it might not be about um, just about articles. We, we know a number of our members like to write books too. So maybe we'll, we'll even expand into that into the future. But uh, I would like to uh, just sign off now with um, a special thanks to my co-host, uh, Karen, and my uh, special guests, uh, Duncan and Linda. Thanks so very much to each of you for uh, your contributions today. We really appreciate it. And thanks to all of you to, who attended. Thanks and good morning, everyone.